God, it's going to be a blessed evening tonight. I want to thank you all for joining me again tonight on Fireside. My voice is a little bit hoarse. We had an awesome service this morning. It was a blessed uh, blessing upon everybody in the entire service. I hope that if you tuned in with us today, that you received a special blessing also. Amen. I want to let you know that God still is on the throne and he's still an on time God. Yes, he is. We're going to continue going right into our Bible study series tonight on Fireside Restoring Broken Dreams, Part Two Restoration. You see, God's grace not only forgives our sin, it's it also restores the negative aspects of our sin. In Joel 2, 18 through 27, God does not hold our old sins against us, nor does he act like forgiveness is a favor to us. We know that for a fact. Even though it is, when President Lincoln was asked how he would treat the rebellious Southerners when they were defeated, he said, and I will repeat, I will treat them as if they had never been away. You see, that's like our Heavenly Father. We all mess up sometimes, and we walk away from Him for a period of time. But when we come back to Him, it's as if that we never left Him. He has open arms 
wanting us, welcome us back to him as if we never left at the beginning. In a world obsessed with getting even and holding on to a grudge, I am glad that we serve a God who consistently looks to forgive and forget. One of the many benefits, my brothers and sisters tonight, of the atonement of Christ is something called justification. And the best way I've heard this described is just as if I'd never sinned. Not only does God forgive our sins, but he also restores what our sin robs from us. You see, God wants us to do something. He wants us to wants to do something in our lives. He wants to restore us. God wants to restore our blessings in our lives. The things that we received once and we held so dear and close to us. You see, God wants to restore what the devil stole from us. You see, the devil doesn't want you to live a victorious, successful life in Jesus. He wants you to be beaten down. He wants you to back you up. He wants to shut you up. He doesn't want you to live in the freedom and the liberty that only comes through Jesus Christ. Let's read, go to uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 18 through 17. Joel chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. If you'll turn with me there. Praise God. We're going to have a blessed evening tonight today. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. Says, then will the Lord be jealous for his for his, for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savior shall come up because he have done great things fear not O land be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things be not afraid ye beast of the field for the pastures of the wilderness do spring from the tree, beareth her fruit. The fig tree, the vine do yield their strength. Believe, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Proposition. God's grace not only forgives our sin, it also restores the negative aspects of our sin. The first thing that God wants us to do, brothers and sisters, God wants to restore you. 
like he talked about in 8 through 18 through 20. It's human nature to hold on to hurt when somebody's done you wrong. However, it's not God's nature. When he forgives, he treats it as if it never happened to begin with. In verse 18, the text turns from what God wants his people to do to what he's going to do. It says, then the Lord will pity his people and jealousy guard the honor of his land. The verb pity looks inward toward the people rather than outward toward other interests. Yahweh di directs his compassion and pity on his suffering people just as Pharaoh's daughter did on the crying baby Moses. Verse 18 is a literal privet in the book. Up to now, the problem has been presented and the response of the people has been called for. Now, God's response unfolds. It is now introduced here. However, since the possibility of restoration was laid out in 2.14, now that possibility is reality, the Lord will, Lord's will. The same structure is found in the flood story, which built up the climax of God's remembering Noah. Then the Lord says, the Lord will reply, look, I am sending you grain and new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy your needs. You will no longer be an object of mockery among the surrounding nations. God's promises, brothers and sisters, expanded in Joel 2.19, eradicating the problem and not simply making up for the loss of agriculture produce in verses 1, chapter 1, verse 10. The uncertainty of God's perhaps of 2.14 now becomes a certainty of yes, I will. In Hosea, God promises to respond to Israelite faithfulness by having the earth provide grain, wine, and oil. In Hosea 2, chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. You see, this happens in that day, the day of the Lord. God hears response using the same thing through the same three agricultural products. For Joel, these events following the Judean response to God fulfilled Hosea's prophecy. Then the Lord vows, I will drive away these armies from the north. I will send them into parched wastelands. Those in the front will be given into the Dead Sea and those at the rear into the Mediterranean. The stench of their rotting bodies will rise over the land. Surely the Lord has done great things. You see, the locust army is now identified by its place of geographical origin. The army from the north will be driven from the land, reversing the closeness of the coming at the day of the Lord. As Yahweh previously drove the plague of locusts away, so he now does with the encroaching army. Since their arrival results in the dry and destroyed land, it is only that this be the locust's final destination, a tit for that, a tit for tat type of conclusion. Thank you, Jesus. Then the Lord vows, I will drive away the armies. Whoops, sorry about that. The removal results in the death of the Alps locusts is killed by water and lack of food in the desert. The huge size of the swarming army is indicated by its finally reaching between two seas. A rising stretch often results from decaying organic material passages in the context, context of death and battle, continuing the military metaphor for the locusts. You have to love how this verse ends. Surely the Lord has done great things. There's a big comeback. 
In this illustration, in a remote Swiss village, stands a beautiful church, a mountain valley cathedral. It has high pillars. Imagine this for a moment. It has high pillars and magnificent stained glass windows. But what makes it special is the most beautiful pipe organ in the whole region. People would come from far lands just to hear the lovely tunes of this organ. One, something went wrong. Once something went wrong with the pipe organ, it releases the wrong tones and something went wrong. The sound of disharmony. Musicians and experts from around the world had tried to repair this organ. No one could find their fault. It was made unique, customized, and no one really knows how to fix it. They gave up. After some time, one little old man came. Why wasn't the pipe organ used? It's not playing right, says the church staff. Let me try. Since he had been lying there, the staff reluctantly agreed to let the old man try. His hand at it. So he did. For two days, the old man worked in almost total silence. The church worker was, in fact, getting a bit nervous. Then on the third day at noon, suddenly the music came. The pipe organ gives off the great best music after so many years that they ever heard. The people in the village heard the beautiful music. They came to the church to see. This old man was playing at the organ. After he finished, one man asked, how did you fix it? How did you manage to restore this magnificent instrument when even the world's experts could not? The old man said, it was I who built this organ 50 years ago. I created it and now I have restored it. You see, my brothers and sisters, God is telling his people to humble themselves before him and he will restore us, us back to where we were. Isaiah 1 and 18 says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. You see, God is saying to us, I know that you, what you have done. You can hide it from others, but not from me. Your secret sins are not secrets to me. You can fool your family, your friends and neighbors, but you cannot fool me. I know what you have done, but I am calling you to come to me and be forgiven. I will take your sins and throw them as far as the east from the west. I will take your sins and throw them into the sea of forgiveness and remember them no more. It will be like it never happened. I will restore you and heal you. You are the most important thing to me, and I want to bring you back. Hallelujah. Transition not only does God want to restore you, but God wants to restore your blessings. The rain he sends. Not only does God want to restore you, my brother and sister, but he also wants to restore your blessings. This foreign concept to us, it's a foreign concept to us. Generally, when we forgive someone, is rare enough. However, to have them give us stuff on top of forgiveness is just unheard of. Yet that is the character of the God we serve. We can see this in verses 21 through 22 when he says, Don't be afraid, my people. Be glad now and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Don't be afraid, you animals of the field, for the wilderness pastures will soon be green again. The trees will again be filled with fruit. Fig trees and grapevines will be loaded down once more. In verses 21 through 22, we revert to the imperative life forms and a call to praise. It's not directly only to people who suffer, but also to the inanimate creation and animals who are also directly affected. Rather than terror, God's people re-experience the gladness and joy they lost. Why? 
because of the mighty acts of Yahweh, exemplified in verse 22 by the restoration of pasture, fruit trees, and most specifically the fig trees and the grapevines. The latter two were loaded down, a play on this same word elsewhere used of the forces or army of the locusts. You see, it was the locusts that destroyed everything and made it barren. The one is overturned and replaced by the other, both physically and systematically. Subsequently, the people, those previously summoned to fear, weep, and pray in Zion, now join the rest of creation in celebration. The basis of their rejoicing is God himself, and secondarily, his actions on their behalf. These include his actions in nature, now not in removing the locusts, but in relieving from drought. Then God tells his people, rejoice, you people of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for the rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. Once more, the autumn rains will come, as well as the rains of spring. Yahweh provides rain by causing it to come down. For many of us, brothers and sisters, rain is only a bother. But for the farmers, in a dry climate, it is the difference between plentiful crops and starvation. Since rain is vital for their society, Israel has several times for different types and periods of rain. The more general terms is more specifically identified as autumn rains and spring rains. These two types of rains indicate the resumption of all rains. That resumption is indeed causing for celebration in the barren times. As a result of the rains returning, God says the thresh, threshing floors will again be peeled high with grain and the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil. After the locusts are expelled in verse 20 and the trees start to bear in verse 22 because the rains have returned in verse 23. Other crops are prepared for consumption and storing away. Two places of production are mentioned for the first time in prophecy, since previously they lay unused as a result of the lack of raw material. The threshing floor is where the wheat and the barley are processed, removing the edible kernel from the waste, the chaff through the process of winnowing. The previously unused site will now be filled, provided probably by the farmers who previously were without any work because of the barren lands, though the subject is unspecified. The process for processing raw material for their liquid content, such as grapes, resulting in wine and olives, resulting in oil, will now overflow like a river that overflows after God's rain. The locusts previously destroyed all of these, but God makes them good in an abundance. You see, God not only restores his people, brothers and sisters, but also returns his blessings on them. He always makes a way for provision. DM Lloyd Jones writes, if you are anxious to obtain some benefits from the Queen of England, the first thing you have to discuss is how can I get into the Buckingham Palace? What have I to do to get admission? then how do I approach this great personage? Is it too obvious in, all, in that realm, and yet we pay no attention to this when seeking blessings from God? We go to God and we expect to get all that we ask for all at once. Not put off, not tomorrow, not the next day. We want it right now. But that is not possible. All blessings come through Jesus Christ, and we must first be at peace with God. When we return to being at peace with God, we experience abundant blessings from God. In Philippians 4, 19, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Think of all the things that our, our sin robs us. What is some things that robs us? Well, it robs us of our joy. It robs us of peace, love, and self-esteem. When we think of the blessings of God, we tend to think of money and possessions, but the blessings of God are much more. 
God knows what we need as far as material things, but he knows that those things mean nothing without inner blessings. You see, God not only wants us to return to material blessings, but more so, he wants to restore our spiritual blessings. He wants you to experience joy again. He wants you to experience peace again. He wants you to be able to look at yourself in the mirror again. Without those things, material blessings don't matter. But wait, God isn't through yet. God wants to restore what the devil stole from you. He wants to give you back what you've lost. You've lost some precious dear things in your life, my brother and sister. The devil is a liar and he's a thief. And God wants to restore to you everything that Satan stole from you. Look at verse 25. The Lord says, I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locusts, the hopping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the cutting locusts. It was I who sent this great destroying army against you. Being human often means being lost bearing loss and never to be regained the years that the swarming locusts had eaten and yet the lord the bringer of the calamity is also the lord of mercy and abundant grace who is fully able to restore i will give you back is what he said our yahweh again speaks directly to his people promising his covenant faithfulness Referring back to the devastating locusts horde, Yahweh repeats each destructive locust type found in Joel chapter 1, verse 4. He also acknowledges that they are his own great army, sent by him, just as are the grain, the new wine, and the oil. This acknowledgement has not yet been specifically mentioned. Now he will repay, restoring the situation to its state prior to the devastation he brings both woe and prosperity god wants to give back to you my brother and sister what the devil has taken from you john 10 and 10 says the thief purpose is to steal and kill and destroy my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life you see jesus is clear that his purpose and satan's purpose are diametrically opposed to one another satan's purpose is to steal kill and destroy jesus came to life and not just ordinary life he came to give you a rich and satisfying life he didn't give you a life of defeat and discouragement and depression we like to think that satan snuck in while he wasn't watching but the truth is, we let him have everything he stole from us. We gave it to him. We chose to let him steal from us because we chose him over God. And yet God wants to restore everything that the devil took from us. He wants to return our joy, our peace, and our self-esteem. In conclusion, I want you to remember one thing. In a world obsessed with getting even and holding on to a grudge, I am glad that we serve a God who consistently looks to forgive and forget. Not only does God forgive our sins, but he also restores what our sin robs from us. Remember, God wants to, re wants to restore us. God wants to restore our blessings. God wants to restore what the devil stole from us. Despite an act of God brought upon his people by their sin, he restored their land and all that was lost. Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight, Lord. We thank you for another word from you. We thank you for this restoration that you're going to give our lives, Lord. Help us to turn back to you. Help us to overcome, Lord all of our shortcomings help us lord to turn to you and not to the latter lord help us to encourage others that they can overcome 
anything that comes in their lives. Help to bring them back to you, Lord, in restoration. For it's these things we pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. God richly bless you. I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday, 6 p.m., right here at Fireside. Good night. And God bless you. Heavenly Father, I come, don't have much to offer, Holy One, I'm humbled by all that you've done, and even though I walk through the valley, oh, and I don't have to fear you would call me from my soul to gladness and I had what more could I want so raise my faith a little high set my spirit on fire come and ask me you to move cause you're the God of restoration the one who gives salvation Lord, let me not come on, let me not come on, oh, oh, oh. let me not come on. You are the dark of the sea, the same God who Bless me, you are the one who makes me strong, oh, and even though I walk through the valley, I don't have to fear, no, 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 no. you will call me from my song to the last and I had. What more could I want? So raise my faith a little higher. Set my spirit on fire. Oh Lord, ask me to move. Show me your restoration. The one who gives salvation. Lord, let me find so raise my faith a little higher.